Hello and welcome to the Pinstripe Post. My name is Ryan Sampson, the host and producer of the show, but he is the star of the show, Joel Sherman. Today is Monday, October 14th. The ALCS starts tonight. Yankees versus Guardians, game one. Carlos Rodon versus Alex Cobb. We're going to break down that matchup. We're going to break down everything about this series, what led, it, what's going into it, and I'm going to get everything's perspective from Joel here about it all if you stick around and watch the Pinstripe Post. Joel, how are you doing on this Monday morning as we get set for game one, man? Yeah, good. You know, uh, it's one of those ones, uh, you know, I don't know if this will make sense to you. It's uh, at the all-star game. It's always an issue if you're in the right place. You know, you've got like 50, 60 of the biggest stars in the game. So if I'm talking to player A, it means I'm not talking to player B, C, D. Uh, I feel a little bit like that now is with both New York teams having gotten this far, am I at the right series? Uh, <laughs> you know, the Mets do feel like the more interesting story and they're playing the biggest player in the sport in Otani. And, um, you know, and somehow I'm not, as, as somebody said, yeah, but they are the Yankees. Uh, they're the biggest team in the sport. Uh, so, I mean, I think that the answer is I could be in the right place, the wrong place, who knows. But uh, it's interesting that both teams have made it this far. As I think that is this the third time they've both made it this far yep. at the same time, uh, having done it in 99 and 2000 also and actually created a Subway World Series in 2000. So a uh, great time for New York sports, right? The Liberty are in the final. The Jets and Giants are playing uh, marquee games. Uh, this weekend, uh, the Knicks are uh, a former player is fighting with the <laughs> current team. The Rangers season started. So really a great time for New York sports right now. It really is, to, to, especially today, Joel. Like today is a wild day in itself. You got Yankees and Mets, Jets Monday Night Football, Rangers are playing hockey. Like to your point, it's it's been crazy bananas. I, we're going to talk about this in Joel's notebook towards the end of the show, but just real quick, preliminary thoughts. When you hear Yankees, Cleveland, because I, you know, before it was the Indians, now it's the Guardians. But for me, Joel, growing up as a fan, as a Yankees fan, this like resembles October baseball. It has a special feel to it because I always remember the 97, 98 both postseason runs, the Yankees and, and Cleveland, like that was always a great matchup. And then later on, obviously, these teams have met up multiple times in the playoffs. There always seem to be that that heated, evenly matched, you know, between the two. What comes to mind real quick right now as you think about the Yankees Cleveland history? Yeah, I found out what a midge was because of this series. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, at this time of year. Uh and it was funny, Jabba Chamberlain was at the Royal uh Yankee uh playoff game uh, when the Yankees eliminated Kansas City in the previous round. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I think I saw a stat that the Yankees and Guardians have played each other in the postseason more than anybody else except for the Yankees and the Dodgers. Yankees and the Dodgers, uh, that's correct. Uh, so like a lot of the last 20, 25 years, the American League has gone through these two teams or you've had to get through these two teams to get where you're going. Um so, uh, yeah, like lots, lots and lots of big games. And what sticks out to me, just kind of moving forward to now, is it is hard to ignore the theme, Ryan, that the AL fell how the Yankees would want it to fall. Uh, starting in 2017, I think it's easy to forget how good a team Cleveland was in 2017. They had gone to Game 7 of the World Series the year before. And uh, I think they were a 100-plus win team in 2017. And the Yankees rallied to beat them uh, three games to two in that division series and have kind of like that magical run to game seven of the ALCS against the Astros. And, of course, Yankee fans don't like that series because of who the 2017 Astros turned out to be revealed to be. But it was a great run by that team. And it felt like back then, you know, that was rookie year for Aaron Judge. Yep. It was the second year for Gary Sanchez. It looked like Greg Bird was breaking out. Gleyber Torres and Clint Frazier were on the horizon. Luis Severino broke out. And it felt like the beginning of a championship run period for the Yankees. And, of course, they have never even gotten that close again. I think game six of the ALCS is as close as they've gotten since then in 19 against Houston. And starting with that series... They are 6-0 and against the AL Central in the postseason since that series. So to me, um, you know, we've mentioned it a few times on the show. Orioles out, Astros out, all AL Central teams. Uh, the Royals were kind of like a gnat 
uh, no midge intention here and <laughs> kind of like, you know, played the Yankees close in all of those games and gave them some issues. But um, yeah, I, I, I think this lays out. And even to this extent, the strength of the Guardians, the by far strength of the team is their late game bullpen. They have four exceptional late game relievers. Those guys got heavily used by the previous series going five games. Now, those guys were also heavily used. I think there were 12 pitchers who appeared in 74 games this year. Four of them are Guardians. It's their best four relief pitchers. And so, to me, uh, is there any point where those guys begin to kind of crack it all? If not, the theme of this series to me is the Yankees have to do big damage before those guys get into the game and avoid having to try to make a comeback against you know, the Kate Smiths and the Tim Herons and, of, of course, Emmanuel Classe. Yeah, it's a great point by you, Joel. The, the Guardians bullpen is outstanding. Uh, they they are one of the best, if not the best, in, in baseball. Uh, Joel, this ALCS, when you hear Yankees ALCS, it has, and to your point, that 2017 year, we always think about the what if. It has been a torture chamber for the Yankees for the last 20 years when you think about the Yankees and the ALCS. Since going up 3-0 in, on Boston in 2004, they are 11 and 26 in ALCS games. They've also lost this this series in their last five trips to the American League Championship Series. We know how long this team has been desperate to go back to the World Series since 09 when they last won it. That happened the last time they went to the World Series. So this is their opportunity. You've laid it out perfectly when it comes to you could not want a better road to the World Series when it comes to the American League Central teams that you're playing. You beat the Royals and now it's on to the Guardians. So, Joel, we've seen I, I want to get into this pitching rotation before we get even more into that bullpen. Uh, the pitching rotation, uh, Aaron Boone lied this out. It's going to be Rodon game one, Garrett Cole game two, Clark Schmidt game three, Luis Heal ga game four. And we got news just now that Marcus Stroman will make the American League Championship season roster and uh, Anthony Rizzo is making the roster, too. When you're looking at the starting pitching matchup here at, Rodon game one. Are you surprised? Are you, are you, how do you feel considering how, when we last time we saw him look dominant the first inning and then it all things unraveled after that? Yeah. You know, the question becomes you could only use the players you have, Ryan. So he's going to pitch someplace in the series. Cole wasn't lined up to pitch one comfortably. So the question becomes do you want Rodon in three or four? Or, and do you want Schmidt or Heal, who hasn't pitched in a while, in game one? I think they're rolling the dice again. I, I, I'll say this, and I don't know if I were a Yankee fan, if I'd be encouraged or discouraged by it. It's one of the fascinating things I'm taking into tonight in game one. I actually think Carlos Rodon is an incredibly open interview subject. I have really enjoyed covering him these two years. And if you watch the press conference yesterday, that felt like half press conference, half therapy session. And uh, on one hand, I would say he openly talked about learning his lesson, which was I wasn't a good poker player like Derek Cole. I expended too much emotion and energy in this. On the other hand, he is 30 years old and in his 10th major league season. Why? And has pitched in playoff games before, albeit not in New York. Why is he learning that lesson now? So I don't know what to take out of that. Did he did he come out of that and realize, hey, this is laser focused time. <laughs> Doing the WWE thing has no value except for if you're trying to get on TikTok. Uh, and so I, you know, if I was a Yankee fan, would I feel a lot better that he maybe understands how to manage the game? Maybe. But what would worry me so much, Ryan, is there is a bully element to him, which is when he is rolling and his stuff is good, he dominates. But when he gets punched, the Salvador Perez thing felt like a punch, well, felt like, oh, Buster Douglas is going to fight back tonight. Oh, what do I do now? And that was not a good reaction by him, how he lost control of his emotions, his control of the strike zone. The Guardians are going to punch. Uh, does he have the ability to take a deep breath, which he didn't in uh, his outing against the, uh, the Royals, and manage a lineup and manage run situations, which is, hey, first and second, no out. 
keep this to a run. Keep like, don't, you know, believe mm-hmm. in your offense that, you know, you're playing at home. You've got a good offense. You could do it. He's got to manage the game. He didn't manage it. He gave up four runs in an inning and was out after dominating early. And so I don't know what to take out of yesterday's press conference. It's one of the things that um, really interests me and intrigues me going into game one. It, it has to. And and you wonder if if this is going to be Rodon's last opportunity or will he get another shot at it, If depending on how this series goes, right, and how it develops. You play it game by game. There's some interesting stuff. You know, the Guardians against left-handed pit, left-handed pitcher pitching. Uh, Jose Ramirez obviously stands out with the best at uh, oh, the second best average. Him, Daniel Schneeman has a 355 batting average. David Fry 287. They, the Guardians aren't bad against left-handed pitching, so you wonder how Rodon is going to do against this team tonight, especially with that fastball. If his fastball, if he can locate it and use that as an elite fastball, he could set up his other stuff. And I think that's where, to your point, if he gets punched. If, say, he makes a mistake and it goes for a home run, can you keep that fastball going as location? Keep it high, get the batter's eye level to change, and use that as a real weapon. I just wonder, does he have that mentality to be able to, to your point, take a punch, adjust, and now now we go attack again? Yeah, I, I find Ramirez also one of the most fascinating players in the series. It was so interesting what Aaron Boone said about him yesterday, where it's like, if you keep calling somebody underrated for like 10 years at some point, can you stop? Uh, I do think that, that Ramirez has had kind of like a stealth hall of fame career for people who haven't been paying attention. Uh, He's such a great player. He's about to finish, I think in the top uh, six in the MVP for the sixth time in his career. Uh, You know, he's a switch hitter with patience and power. He's a very good fielder. He's a very good base runner. You know, he had another, what, 30, 30 year this year. Or yep. Maybe, if I want, like, you know. I think no, he, he had 30, 40, 30 year. 40, I think he missed a 40, 40. Missed a 40, 40. On Homer, was it? Is that yeah. what he missed it by? I mean, he's just a great player. Uh, you know, when people look back again at that 2016, 2017 uh, Guardian period, you know, Lindor and Ramirez are the left side of the infield. Those guys might both end up in Cooperstown. You know, Corey Kluber was a multi-time Cy Young Award winner. Andrew Miller was about as dominant a guy as you were going to get out of the bullpen. I mean, they really had a special team. This team is not, I I believe, near that team as far as quality of of opponent uh, for the Yankees. Uh, What I was going to say about Ramirez that's interesting is if you came to a big situation, you would prefer for him to bat left-handed. His numbers batting right-handed against lefty pitching are spectacular. On the other hand, he hit 25 homers batting left-handed, and you'll be playing the first two games at Yankee Stadium, which certainly favor left-handed power. So I think the Yankees will have interesting situations about how they want to attack him and with whom uh, in this series. So uh, I think that, that will be interesting to watch. But he's clearly the biggest difference maker in the lineup. And then they have other good complementary yes. players around them. And, you know, the Yankees did such a great job against Bobby Witt in the last series, which really strangled the Royals. Uh, I expect that Ramirez, with all his experience playing this time of year, but not a good postseason player so far in his career. He's had some moments. He's had some but, moments. I mean, that but, last series was pretty yeah. big for him. Yep. Yeah. But the, but the overall numbers, it's a little bit like what the Yankees should be hoping for with Judge to some degree is the numbers might not be great, but can he have a couple of Ramirez moments? Right. Uh, like if the numbers aren't going to be great. And so anyway, uh, he's clearly the, the biggest difference maker. And I'm fascinated by especially who out of the bullpen attacks him. Like which way do they go? Do they spin him right? Do they spin him left? And who's used? Yeah, Jose Ramirez has a 1.081 OPS against left-handed pitching. Uh, you know, against right-handed pitching. I mean, you if you wanted to go that way, I believe I'm I have it pulled up right here. I think high 700s, but it's yes. 25 homers, which I think was the 12th most homers by a lefty hitter this year. So, and again, the games are at Yankee Stadium. Correct. So, I think that that's a interesting game within a game dynamic uh for the fans to watch is who who does uh, you know uh, Aaron Boone, Matt Blake, and the you know the game strategy group that talks to them before the game and influences this believe should go after Ramirez in big spots. 
Yeah. And then Joel, I, the other follow-up I have here, since Rodon is going game one, were you not, I not, not shocked, I should say, but Luis Hill, you're waiting till game four for him. Now that could be a pivotal game, a swing yep. game, obviously in that situation. How do you feel? I mean, he hasn't pitched in a while here. He didn't pitch at all during the, the division series. And, and it's been a while since he last pitched. I get it. But again, I, I go back to like the good news is you didn't need him in the division series. The bad news is you didn't need him in the division series. So, and the division series had that crazy schedule that allowed you to avoid uh, using a fourth, fourth starter. This series won't allow that. Um, and you could only use who's on your roster. And I certainly would use him over Marcus Stroman. Uh, you know, the stuff is not close. Uh, he had a strange start against the Guardians earlier in the year. I looked at it the other day. He had like, I think he didn't give up a lot of runs, but he walked six guys. I think he might have given up one hit and walked six Guardians in a very short start in Cleveland earlier this year. Uh, you know, which then goes back to everything you need to know about Luis Hill. Like, he didn't give up hits. If he doesn't walk guys, he tends to pitch very well. Will a guy who has not pitched a lot be able to control it himself? Uh, he did pitch a simulated game at the ball at, at Yankee Stadium yesterday. Uh, we know that's not the real thing, but you've got to do the best you can. And he's the guy who should start a game. And whatever game he was starting, Ryan, you'd be asking me that question, right? If he was starting game one, you'd be like, he hasn't pitched in a while. Should right. he be starting game one? If he was starting game three, he hasn't. So he's got to pitch. And I think what makes it interesting is I think they put Stroman on because in case they need somebody to eat up a lot of innings in a game that's a blowout one way or the other, or a starter is knocked out extremely early and they want to try to steal three innings someplace, he's a guy who could do it. And that's where the not having Nestor Cortez does become a factor. But, you know, like at this time of year, if you're only missing one key player, you're probably ahead of the game. No, I, I totally agree with you, Joel. And I think, you know, a lot of Yankees fans are looking at this as, you know, Again, and, and you've discussed this before. You're the more talented team. You're heading into an American League Championship Series against a Guardians team that does not match you talent-wise, right? You are top-tier talent with the Judges, Sotos, and Coles of the world. And there's Nestor Cortez is probably the biggest injury you're dealing with. Rizzo has made it back. I'd be interested to see how they deploy him. Do you think he starts tonight, game one? Like, how do you feel about Rizzo with this fractured? I don't know if you have any insight there, but how do you feel he's going to be able to make his return with the with this injury? Well, I can't believe he'll be on the roster and not start. Yeah. Uh, you know, because his value on the bench is somewhat limited, uh, unless you think he could give you a good lefty at bat late in the game. Uh, and something we should probably talk about in this is just how spectacular all their even righty big relievers are against lefty hitters. Uh, so I'm not sure you gain a lot of advantages, but hitting left handed late in the game. Uh, I'll say this. There were a lot of reasons the Yankees beat the Royals in the last round, you know, starting with they were just better yeah. than them. Uh, one of the biggest things was Bertie and Cabrera played really well I at know. first base on both sides of the ball. I thought they both had good at bats and I thought they both handled the, the you know, the, the, the game at first base. Well, Bertie's double play oh. uh, in game four was a really big moment uh, in that game. Uh, that he started for a guy who had very limited experience there. His uh, athleticism and baseball mind kind of like allowed him to make a big play in the game. He looked like and, he'd been playing there for a couple of years. <laughs> so I he... still say the late season version of Rizzo before he got hurt was a good version because he played, he played defense better than at any point this year. And his at-bats were good, but they weren't power at-bats. And to me, I would just be asking the question, if they're not power at bats, do the Yankees actually get more out of having Rizzo on the field and on the roster than the two other guys? It is a tough thing to tell a team leader veteran with championship pedigree, hey, you're healthy enough to play, but we're going to play two guys out of position instead of you. So I, again, you know, like if I were making that list of things that I'm fascinated Going into tonight, I mentioned who's pitching against Ramirez late. Uh, I would be the, what exactly does this version of Anthony Rizzo, which lacked power in the last month of the season when he came back, now 
like even these two fingers, they probably are not 100% with two compromised fingers. What level of power and offense can you bring? Uh, it's, I, I get it. It's a, he's a tough guy to keep off the roster because it's Anthony Rizzo, but it's not that Anthony Rizzo. And the other two guys were doing a, a pretty good imitation of who Rizzo was in September. Uh, Anthony Rizzo in his career, five plate appearances against Alex Cobb, one for four uh, with a walk. So not really an extensive history against Alex Cobb. So you'd be interested to see if they do decide to play him tonight. And to your point, if he's healthy enough to be on the roster, you're probably going to end up playing him. It just, you are, and I thought this was something I talked with Tommy about. I was like, I'm really impressed with Birdie and his at-bats. I think even more than it defensively, just because he he was getting on base, and it felt like, and, and in big key moments, it's like, okay, Birdie's slapping a single to the right, or okay, Birdie worked a wall. Like, he he felt more in, in tune to the game, if that made sense, and like, he just... He plugs himself in, and I'm like, okay, Birdie, I can get behind this a little bit first base. Like you, you, you're, you're, and he gives you the speed element on the bases, which is something that Rizzo, unfortunately, I, like I love the guy as as a person, but as a player, it's like, I, you know, you don't have that speed element to your game anymore. You may have the leadership and the defensive capabilities more than any other first baseman left in the playoffs, besides Freddie Freeman. I would say, like, you have that there, but I just Birdie provides something a little bit more. Am I crazy to think that, Joel? No, I and and you mentioned Birdie, I. You know, it was fascinating. The Yankees didn't score a lot of runs in the division series, but I thought their at-bat quality was pretty terrific. They The problem was they didn't hit with runners on yes. base and runners in scoring position. And again, a lot of this fell on to Judge. I thought Judge had three kill shot moments to kind of really knock the Royals out of like, hey, nice, nice going, guys, but we're the Yankees, you're the Royals. And they ended up being, in, you know, it's two men on and no out in the first inning of each of the first two games, and he struck out both times. And then was it in game four? He hits into a double play in the first inning. And, like, that was the Yankee problem in this series led by their best player, which was, you know, the back quality for Cabrera, Birdie, Volpe, Verdugo, uh, uh, Gleyber Torres. Like, a lot of the supplementary guys, the back quality was terrific. Yes. Uh, and... The big guy didn't have that level of it. And and Soto's at-bats were, you know, he's Soto. He hardly ever has a bad at-bat. But he didn't have that kind of kill shot thing that he's yeah. also good at where it kind of breaks the game open with the double on the gap or the homer or the whatever. And clearly, uh, there we know when those two guys are percolating, the Yankees might be the best team in the sport. Right. Uh and uh, over these this round, and if they're fortunate enough to win this round, next round, they're going to need – it's hard to believe they could get from here to back over here in the Canyon of Heroes, about five blocks that way, uh, without, without those two guys playing great, especially Judge. We just haven't heard from Judge yet in any significant way. I thought his at-bat quality Was over the last better. two games got much, much better, uh, and, and I – Forgive me if I have it slightly wrong. But I think the team has played like four games in 15 days at this point. Uh, and they could probably use the, some reps here. Yes. I mean, not that they want to avoid. If they could sweep, sweep. You know, you win in five, you win in five. But they baseball is such a routine, everyday oriented thing. And they just simply have not played a lot. You know, it's why Louis Seal hasn't been in a game. Yeah, no, I think you bring up a great point there, Joel, With when it comes to Judge. I, you know, he, it was ugly. Let's be real. It was ugly the first two games. Third game, I thought, the, like you said, the at-bats were getting better. And then the game four, he hit the double towards the end. You're like, okay, that looked like an Aaron Judge swing. Bunch like, of walks laid off right. some tough pitches that right. he does when he's going well. Uh, you know, it's Aaron Judge. I, like in April, you expect that there's a light switch that will go on and it'll be Aaron Judge. But the season is short now. Correct. You don't have May and June, July. Yeah. You know, there's just at most you have 12 games left in your season. And no, I I agree. And there's I'm some sorry, 14 games left in your season, and uh, you know, it's got to happen now. For by the way, for the Yankees and for him, like you don't you don't want the rep of the good the great regular season player only. You know, this is he needs a signature moment or two that helps carry them. 
hundred percent. And just some con- some context here for Aaron Judge against Cleveland in the playoffs. He has twelve career games in the playoffs versus the Guardians. Uh, eight and four in that record. Fifty six plate appearances. Forty nine abs. Six hits. Three home runs. Seven ribbies. Seven walks. 31 strikeouts, a 55.4 strikeout percentage with a 122, 232, 327, three slash line, the 559 OPS. So Judge in the in the, in the playoffs against the Guardians, it's not been pretty, but he has had some home runs. So you wonder, again, if game four, he can carry over some of that momentum of approach, taking good pitches, you know, taking bad pitches, and then making contact when you can in those situations. Because you brought up, Again, another good point about this Yankee squad and something that impressed me this last series, even though I thought there were moments they could have killed this team even more, is that a lot of guys were getting on base. Gleyber Torres, I thought, had a phenomenal series. Uh, and again, we highlighted Birdie. We highlighted Verdugo. Volpe, I thought, had a good series. Giancarlo Stanton came through. I mean, we talked about this before this that last series or even the middle of that series. Stanton... In the playoffs, and I said this, and it's not he not he's not Babe Ruth, but he's like Babe Ruth in the the way he just kills these teams in these moments, and he continues to surprise me. I've forever sworn off. I will never say another bad word about John Carlos Stanton because the guy just he's a clutch player. I don't know how else to put it, Joel. He is a clutch player in these biggest moments, and he continues to come through in these moments. I don't know if it's him being more focused because John Carlos Stanton. I think he's a very cerebral person, if that makes it like he is, he thinks in the moment. And I think the it's a long regular season. It's a marathon. You hear how much your body gets broken down. Fans are booing you. You, you strike out, you flail at these pitches that you look like you've never swung a bat before in your life. But then he gets hyper focused in these playoff moments and he just locks in and he puts insane damage on these pitchers. And in these moments, I don't know, Joel, how do you feel about John Carlos Stanton here and what he's been able to do continuously in the playoffs for the Yanks? Well, among Yankees with 100 plate appearances in the postseason, and that's not a small number considering how much they've been in the postseason over the years, this is the list of people who have a better OPS than John Carlos Stanton. One is Babe Ruth, two is Lou Gehrig, and three is Reggie Jackson. He's fourth. He's fourth. It's almost 1,000 OPS uh, for the postseason. And... uh, I try to come to peace in my column in uh, the post in Tuesday's post. You know, it's online at nypost.com if you're interested. Um, I wrote a lot about Holmes, Volpe, and Stanton. You know, three guys who, you know, to your point, I'm never going to criticize them again. These guys who get criticized a lot during the season. I was like, this feels a little bit like a redemption tour right now. I think what Stanton has is... So many people say, I don't give a shit what anyone thinks about me. But you're almost inhuman if you don't give a shit what people think about you. I actually think Stanton doesn't give a shit. And I think that helps him at this time of year. And this is what I mean by it is I think he's come to peace with who he is, which is I... I, I'm never going to be that MVP Stanton again who could play defense and run, et cetera. I am this version, so I'm going to protect my legs. Do you know the self kind of confidence it takes? Like, you think he's not aware that he knows everyone's sitting and screaming, run, run. And he's like, no, because what you want me to do is take four at bats a day. And if I run, run, that might end. So I'm going to do it this way. Does you think he doesn't know that the way he attacks the ball means that he's sometimes going to miss a pitch by two feet and look like he's never actually played, but he's come to peace with this is who I am. And he, that I think at this time of year where you can blocking out noise is so vital, Ryan, I think he's kind of mastered that. And I also think he is a guy who understands he's very smart, very smart. And in some RBI situations, he'll shorten up and he'll try to get it in play. He is not just some brute. Obviously, brute is his game. But there is some, every once in a while, when they need an RBI, just an RBI, he has some craft there also. But I think his ability to know himself and not care that you're going and i'm using you metaphorically for the fan base that you 
are in this debate about I'm never going to be critical again. Of course you are. He's going to go one for 32 next April with 20 strikeouts, and you're going to go, they got to waive this guy. And because we've had this discussion for like six, seven years about him, which is we vacillate between he's never going to hit the ball again and he's carrying the team. And that's just who he is. That's his profile. He's going to get hurt, as Brian Cashman infamously said at the winter meetings or GM meetings, wherever it was last year, that it's part of his profile. It is part of his profile. He's going to get hurt at a point during the year. Uh, but if he's healthy at this time of year, he is a difference maker. And I think it's because he can wall off the world and not give a crap at the highest levels. Yeah. I mean, it, I just think back also when the Yankees clinched the play, uh, the division and they were celebrating the locker room, I forgot who it was that asked him and they go, you know, you guys are the top dog. You're the team to beat in the playoffs. It seems like, and he goes, we should be. And, and it just, that, that, that attitude yeah. of, he has that, he has that moxie of like, yeah, we're the fucking best team in the AL. We know we are. And I'm going to show up and I'm going to do what my, do my thing. And it just, it continues to impress me about him as a person and as a player. He's he taken. A, he's a great interview. Yeah. Because he, as opposed to most Yankees, does not A, do vanilla and B, do unreality, including about himself. He doesn't play the, oh, uh, you know. I was great when he wasn't, or we were great when we weren't. Now, he's not critical of any individual player, but he doesn't do the narrative of, oh, every team. He's like, we're the Yankees. We're supposed to win here. We understand this. And it's not just coming out of his mouth. It isn't just the championship bus nonsense that we hear so much over the last 20 years. I think he understands. I was the mercenary brought in when they didn't get Otani to be a difference maker. That hasn't happened yet. This is why I'm here. This is the only reason I'm here is to be a difference maker for championships. And I I think he's as close to a clubhouse truth teller as the Yankees have. I would agree. I would agree. He he he's impressed me, man. He just continues to impress me. And I'm looking forward to see how he performs in this American League Championship series against the Guardians. Because I know they're gonna count on him and he's gonna have a lot more opportunities, especially if, if Judge continues to struggle in those key moments. But Joel, that brings me up to do up. Uh, I want you to rank three players here. Can you give me three players besides Judge, Cole, and Soto? Who are three players right now that you think needs to perform well in this American League Championship Series in order for them to win it? To win it. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the easiest answer would be Rodon Schmidt and uh, Hill, uh, just to keep uh, the Guardians down. Uh, and allow that period. To me, the Yan- and, and, look, Class A gave up a three-run homer in a big spot in the previous series. But if you're counting on scoring on the Guardian bullpen late, you're probably not in a winning situation. So the Yankees have to win the first six innings of these games, which means on both sides of it. So their starters have to keep Cleveland down, and the Yankees have to do some real damage against the Cobbs and the Boyds and the Bibbies uh, and what I assume will be a bullpen game. You know, you're talking about Hill, like is game four Ben Lively? Is it Gavin Williams? Or are those guys just length guys within a bullpen game? Uh, I think that Stephen Vogt showed he's going to be very, very aggressive with his bullpen. Kate Smith was one of the you could argue Kate Smith was the best reliever in the major leagues this year. He was certainly one of the five best in the American League. And we saw he is going to be in the game when Stephen Vogt thinks, whether that's the fourth inning or the sixth inning or the eighth inning, that Stephen Vogt thinks that's the biggest moment of this game to kind of like stop the momentum of the other team. He's going to attack dog with Kate Smith. Um, and so to me, that means the top of the Yankee lineup and the starting pitching have to do damage. And, you know, if I told you Glaber was going to have the kind of series he had, you know, you would have thought, oh, man, in front of uh, Soto Judge, that's going to be a lot of damage. And Yankees didn't score enough in the previous round. They didn't do enough damage against some starting pitching. You know, Alex Cobb, again, you talked about Hill. I mean, Alex Cobb has made four starts this year. 
this will be his fifth start of the season. He hasn't pitched a lot. He's gotten hurt multiple times, including as soon as he came to the Guardian. He was hurt when he came to the Guardians, mm -hmm. pitched and got hurt again. Uh, so he, the question is, how sharp is he going to be? That's a scout who covered the game in the, uh, against the Tigers told me, hey, man, that's a smart pitcher, but he lacks some command control. And what would you expect for a guy who hasn't pitched a lot? Uh, the Yankees drew a ton hell of a lot of walks yes. against the Royals, you know, the you've got to turn the walks into runs. There's got to be a big couple of hits in there. Uh, and the damage for me for the Yankees has to come in that early portion. So I don't know. Like, I think the key part for the Yankees is doing damage in the first six innings. So everyone's going to get two at bats pretty much at least. And your starting pitching can't let them get away where it becomes a, oh, we could go an extra inning with our starter. We could go another inning, another inning, because we're ahead five to two. And then we unleash hell with our four big guys late. So I think there's that that feels like the pressure point for me. The Yankees have to win the early rounds of this fight. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, uh, considering, again, we highlight the bullpen from the Guardians is so damn good and so dangerous. You don't want to be playing a I tie mean, game. I encourage fans, like, go, like, call up the splits on guys like Hunter Gaddis and Classe and Kate Smith and Heron. I mean, these are guys, like, the you think, oh, they're bringing their righties into the game. Their righties are devastating against lefties. Uh, so these guys are all going to be challenges for Soto and Chisholm and Rizzo, et cetera. And they're going to, the Yankees are still going to have to be the, we found the couple of big at bats when they walked two guys, the payment was a three run homer. Cause I uh, think the guardians will have, my suspicion is the guardians will have trouble. Do you know the guardians? I I'm forgive me for this. I'm going to, I think I'm going to be right, but I'm going to be in the ballpark. I think the Guardians scored 22 runs against the Yankees this season in six games. I think nine of them came in ghost runner innings. So that That's means, a good stat. Right? So, like, obviously no ghost runner in the postseason. So the, 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 the Guardians had a lot of trouble scoring against the Yankees. Now, it's the playoffs in the next week. Maybe they'll hit the heck out of this Yankee staff. But in general – like the Royals, they don't score easily. Mm -hmm. And I, the Yankees, especially their bullpen, pitched great last round. So I think that the Yankees will hold Cleveland down. Can the Yankees do enough? Like, I would play a game of, if the Yankees got five, five, how many times could Cleveland beat them in a seven-game series? Oh, I mean, it probably maybe once, to be to be frank. I mean, it just the Cleveland offense, like... It, it's not, it's not, I, I don't want to be wrong here. It's not scary. You know what I mean? Like they have players, but it's, it's Jose Ramirez and company. I mean, yes. Stephen Kwan is a nice guy, a nice player that gets on base, has a nice high average. But if you can get Jose Ramirez out, especially in key situations, I think you should be able to keep this offense in check. I mean, Josh Naylor, whatever, like, you know, I, that'll be a fascinating situation to see how he goes against a Cole, you know, like how Cole reacts to it facing him again. Glaber Torres has the rock the baby thing last time they were in the playoffs. So it'll be interesting to see those storylines and how those play out. I know that's more like the nonsense part of the game, but it is interesting to see the history between them, how you get those guys out. But it's really, it's Jose Ramirez. How do the Yankees starters get this offense and limit them to damage? And do the Yankees get after them early and get men on and get those key hits in big moments? Yeah, uh, it's like pro it feels like Project 5. If they got to five runs seven times, I don't think that Cleveland can do it four times in a seven-game series. I would agree. I would agree. Just some more stats on the Cleveland Guardians bullpen. 1.79 ERA this year. They had a 0 .0, 0 .88, uh whip. I mean, they have a strikeout percentage of 27%, all better than the Yankees in the in comparative in the bullpen. So uh, they do have a big advantage in the, in the bullpen. Class A, Gaddis, Heron, and Smith. They're big four. Heron is the lefty. They appeared in over three hundred games this year during the regular season and they had a 170 ish era combined those four guys uh, again a scout i talked to said i watched how heavily in oct in um april stephen boat was using these guys plus scott barlow and nick sandlin they all were heavily used relievers and he said rookie manager making a mistake he's going to burn them all out and it turned out those four guys didn't burn out they blew out 
opponents uh, with how good their stuff was. It continued. You know, Class A had his bad moment, but still came back and got a two-inning save uh, to to win the clinching game. Uh, and I, I I would not want to try to score against Class A as a meth. You know, I'll say this is if I'm saying five games where can the Yankees score five a game? If four of these games are Cleveland is leading with six outs to go, the Yankees are in trouble. Yeah, no, you're 100% right there, Joel. All right, let's get some more stats involved in this conversation and bring in our guy Tommy Hogan for Hogan Analytics. What's up, Tommy? What's up, guys? Uh, quick quick trivia question before we get into it. Joel, do you know which Yankee had the highest average exit velocity of the ALDS? I would wonder if it's Volpe just because I did a thing yesterday. Volpe hit five balls to the right side uh, that he smoked, and all five went for outs. Four of them, it was like Tommy Pham had a magnet in his glove for Volpe. Four of them went to Tommy Pham. The fifth was a line drive double play to the first baseman that had a 520 expected average and instead turned into a double play. So just because I did some work on Volpe yesterday, I know he hit the ball hard. Is the answer Volpe? It is Anthony Volpe. 98.9 exit velo he averaged in the ALDS. Just to put that Great in Great at court. bats. Four walks, one strikeout. He was but great. He had trip and again we play this game if i had told you before that series that volpe would outplay wit you'd be like just start booking the next round and volpe outplayed wit it would be a little bit like this series if i tell you chisholm outplays ramirez just be like oh there's going to be a subway series or a mega team series between the yankees and the dodgers right that that's how it almost feels because the other team's offense in both situations revolved around a singular player at such a high level. And the fact that Volpe outplayed Witt was a big deal in that series. And Volpe was not fully rewarded for great at-bats. There were, so there were 14 Yankees with 100 plate appearances in the regular season. Only Anthony Rizzo had a lower exit velo than Anthony Volpe in the regular season. And, and just to compare him to the other, the big guys on the team, Stanton, 94.9, would have thought he was a little higher than that. Judge, 95.5, and, and Soto was at 97.7. So Volpe had the hardest hit exit velo for the Yankees in that. Big, uh, and, and, and look, I, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off twice here, Tommy, but like, if you're, there's nothing that matters like the short game for the Yankees, right? Like, they got to win a championship this year but if you were playing the long game won't be handling october when you consider how long his career likely is going to be with the yankees that he that this he wasn't buckled by the four games he didn't uh, he made a key error in game one of the previous series it did not knock him down he came back uh and it's a little bit why i think so much about rodan's start tonight because he signed for four more years here and maybe you could find some eat the money AJ Burnett trade for him to get out of some money later on. Uh, especially he had a pretty good year. Maybe you know somebody would take this a lot of the contract for if you wanted nothing back. But you know he's a key guy moving forward. And the only way to be a key Yankee moving forward is is the Yankees think you can handle this time of year. So that was really good four games for Volpe for that big picture and a really bad start for Rodon for that picture. So I'm kind of interested, does Volpe continue with this series and does Rodon show, Hey, you could trust me. You can give me the ball in a game one against a team that I should be able to handle and it, everything will be okay. I'll get you 15, 18 outs. Let's see. He had that little moment at second base too with Michael Garcia handled that well. So it was definitely an impressive opening series for, uh, for Volpe in the playoffs. And now just the Who's break. Fault? Down. Who's fault? Let's let uh, again. I'm gonna cut you off there. Who's okay. fault was that at second base? I mean, Michael was swiping for the ball, and Volpe gave him a hard tag and gave him like a little shove, I guess, towards the bit. towards the face. It was so, I mean, Jazz Chisholm's fault. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it was Jazz yeah. Chisholm's fault, and it was not. It was doing that thing that I would worry about with players like Jazz Chisholm. I can only tell you this. I don't know if it resonated over the television. I will tell you this in the ballpark. 
When the double play, so leadoff runner on, the royal crowd comes alive again. When Birdie makes the play, and a hell of a play, that crowd goes dead. And in that, like, second before this thing starts at second base, you're like, this series is over, mm -hmm. and everybody knows it. Let them walk to the dugout. When Chisholm comes over and begins to chirp, and now Cole gets involved, it reopened the door that was the, hey, I got to deal with my shit instead of dealing with everyone's stuff, which was let the sleeping dogs lie. Let the Royals walk off the field here. We are in complete control of this game and this series now. And it reopened the door. And it's, and by the way, a lot of Yankee people think that also, just so you know. Uh, so these are big games. You, it, It's got to be team, team. What does it feel the game? What does the team need? You can't have that kind of moment and they have some players as we know who could get very like oh the world is watching me right now so i'm going to do my thing does it have anything to do with the scoreboard no does it have anything to do with the series no so got to be able to control these moments yeah was there any, sorry Tommy, i cut you off a few times it's all good was there any though like defend your teammate to it like no because i think it was, it, it, it was th there was nothing breaking out like yeah like like, I think whatever it looked like on television, again, I don't think Volpe was being condescending. I was thinking he was saying, okay, man, we're all good now. We're, we're all good. Pay you on the back. Get, like, like, you did your thing. I did my thing. We got it out. Let's go play baseball. And I think it's over there. Right. Just because because Garcia is a da, 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 da guy also, right? He's going to – and this whole thing about getting locked in. Is, he said this on social media. Right. Freaking turn your social media off especially at this time of year. It's not the real world. You know what the real world is? The games are the real world. And so you've got to control this kind of stuff at, at this time. To your point, if Josh Naylor is doing the rock the baby, they lost the series, man. That's the greatest punishment. You want to punish somebody, eliminate them. That's punishment. So anyway, I, I, I'm off the soapbox. <laughs> So I did this before the the, uh, the DS against the Royals, and the Yankees did not have good numbers against the Royals starting pitching. A little bit different against the Guardians starting pitching. So against Alex Cobb, I have the 11 guys that I think we could see in this series, the eight that we know we'll see, plus the three potential options at, at first base. Cobb versus those 11, Yankees hit 328 off Alex Cobb and, and 67 at-bats. They saw him a lot with Tampa. They saw him a lot with Baltimore. Six home runs as well in those 67 at-bats. They Who's don't have home any, runs, Tommy. Um, Glaber's got two off of them. Soto's got two off them. Seven for 11, Juan Soto. Matchup to watch tonight. Ooh, so uh, you tell Judge, me to bet Soto home run tonight. That would be the play tonight. Okay. That would be the play. <laughs> um, Judge, three for 12 with a homer. And uh, Stanton also has a homer, but he's two for 14. As your father, I just tell you not to bet. But <laughs> Too late, Joel. Too late. <laughs> My father passed away many years ago. I lost that advice already. I don't, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> I was stepping in here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tanner Bybee, who will probably see either game two, game three, no at-bats. Nobody has an at-bat against him. The Yankees had not seen him this year. Matthew Boyd, uh, Yankees three for – or seven for 31, 226, two homers. Those two, Soto and Judge. That's good. And then um, game four, Joel, you think could be a, a bullpen game. But I think the other option would be Gavin Williams. So the Yankees or, did, ben, or Ben Lively. Sure. Um, the Yankees did see Gavin Williams this year. And they went four for 15 off him. Judge, a homer in that game. So if you if you add in Cobb and Boyd, the two starters, we'll know we'll see. The Yankees will see 296 off them. If you add in Williams' number as well, 292. So the Yankees do have good numbers off of these starters. I, I, I would say this. I mean, these are still not substantial subsets uh, we're looking at. In the case of someone like Cobb, it is surgeries ago, like those Tampa Bay days, sure. which is when they built up most of these numbers, the same for Boyd, uh, surgeries ago. But it just fits into the bigger narrative that uh, Ryan and I were discussing earlier, which is the strength of the team is the last four innings, not the first five innings pitching. And just stuff-wise, the stuff is going to be different from these guys. Now, clearly, Matthew Boyd is pitching – in a way to suggest like he's a reliever. Like I'm going as hard as I can. And that that has was basically almost like one time, one and a half times through the lineup and a couple of starts against Detroit. 
So I do think that the theory for the Guardians will be we have a great long bullpen. Let's attack as much as possible. I do think over seven games is a little tougher to do that. Like if I were a Met fan after watching the Mets lose nine to nothing, what I would be hanging on is this is a bullpen game today for a team that was in his bullpen a lot against the Padres. And is there, you know, the water torture, which is at some point it's like all good until it's not Mm -hmm. because it's been used a lot. I don't know how Cleveland could get from here to the end of this series without using to overusing to abusing their bullpen. Uh, And the Yankees need to get them to abusing by knocking those starters around and out of games early because they're going to see the bullpen and as counterintuitive as it sounds, see it as early as possible because you've done damage where you're up a couple of runs because you did damage against starting pitching and then begin to have the, yeah, the relievers were good in game one, but this guy threw 25 pitches. This guy threw 28 pitches. Can he come back tomorrow? How about by even with an off day by games three, four, and five, which are serial Yankees, the, the, the Yankees have to beat the hell out of the starting pitchers of the Guardians. And a little nugget, this maybe it's something, maybe it's nothing. But I think when you guys were talking about Class A, there's got to be a few Yankee fans out there that say, "Well, we we actually hit him well. We we do well." He's got a two four five ERA in fourteen and two thirds innings against the Yankees. Versus everyone else, it's one six three. Not it's not too much of a difference, but that's still what three quarters of a run more per nine innings against the Yankees than he does against anybody else. The problem is that two four five probably gets you into Cooperstown. Yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. Maybe, like, maybe like his maybe bad enough. pitching gets you into Cooperstown. Is his his uh, the rest of it gets you in unanimously like Rivera, right? So. I just, it's not a good situation if the Yankees are facing Class A with the game on the line. Yeah, look, can he can he get slider happy like he did against Kerry Carpenter, throw three in a row and make a mistake on the third one? Yeah, it's not something. He had literally the second lowest OPS against in Major League history this year. Dominant. Led the league in saves now three years in a row. He's been, he's been great. All right, uh, before I let you go, Tommy, we did this last uh, preview round. I want to do it again. I want to get both of your guys' X-Factor. Who is the one player that's going to be the X-Factor in this series? I'll start off with Joel. Who's your X-Factor in this uh, American League Championship Series? Yeah, I'm going to do it again. Um, I, I'm i going to pick Chisholm <laughs> because okay. I think he could take the team one of two ways. Uh, and – he was out hitting early all by himself on the field yesterday with James Rousen. Uh, I think there is, but I think they have a lot of guys like, like these bullpen guys are all going to be in the game again. Uh, the three guys at the end just were impeccable last round, right? The, the Kane Lee Holmes Weaver, especially Weaver. Wow. How good he's been now for, uh, since, since the beginning of September, uh, I just feel like you could convince me again that Chisholm has a one for 20 ALCS and does some stuff that you don't like. And you could convince me he has a seven for 20, three homer ALCS MVP because talent wise, like, like it is not inconceivable in the Volpe outlaying wit that Chisholm could outplay Ramirez. And if Chisholm outplays Ramirez, the Yankees are going to win the series. Or I would move them from probably like a 60-65% chance of winning the series to 75-80% chance of winning the series. Yeah, I would agree. We lost Tommy here for a second while he deals with internet problems. But I will say, I thought it was interesting about Jazz. And you you, you talk a lot about him and and, and how much of an X factor he can be. I'm fascinated by Chisholm because he's – I saw him play a ton of games at City Field. And he, and I knew he was talented. He is more talented than I thought he was. And I don't, can I, it will sound paternal also, like a dad thing. It's like, I'd like him not to waste the talent. Because I think he could be exceptional. Well, I do. I think he, I think he is Alfonso Soriano. 
he's he's going through this for the first time, right? Like he's never been in these big moments. So this is like now you're on the big boy stage. You're playing in front of the craziest fans in the world. You're playing the biggest games of your career. And these are the moments that are going to matter the most when it comes to your career and, and defining it a little bit. Uh, I thought he had some cool, like not cool, but like interesting comments after this last series, you know, how the Yankees have allowed him to be the little brother and, and how they are trying to big brother him along, you know, like maybe judge is saying after the series, you know, man, like we don't say that after, you know, like, Oh, they got lucky for game two after they won. Like maybe we should tone that down a little bit and, but still be yourself, be the energetic self of, I'm going to be Jazz Chisholm. You're going to do your thing. You're going to come up with these big, big, big at bats. And if you can come through with us, like to your point, if he can have those big moments, it could be a huge X factor for this Yankee squad. And it, even if it's just stealing a base, it, it, he can do those type of things and they have a serious impact on the Yankees team. You know, like, again, I, I, I would just say this. is He could have the kind of series where if they advance, you're sitting there and going, should he be batting cleanup instead of Wells? Like he's, I mean, he really is talented. Again, I'm saying the obvious here, except for that I saw him play a lot and I didn't realize the level of it. But he's really undisciplined. And, on, you know, verbally, on the field, doing some stuff, in the batter's box. The ref- is there a, ref- a refined version of him finishes in the top 10 for MVP? He, it's It's... He reminds me so much in like even he's not quite as tall, I think, but like Soriano was like this lean guy. If you saw him and you're like, how does he generate so much power? And then you saw the whip in the swing and Jazz has that, that whip in the swing where the ball just takes off. And, you know, Soriano had great seasons. He almost was the difference in a team winning a World Series in 01. You know, he hits the homer off a chilling with Rivera on the mound. He's going to be remembered forever for the Yankees. You could convince me that Chisholm hits that home run for the Yankees this year. Yeah. And not by some fortune like, hey, every once in a while a guy hits a homer. But because he might be the most talented guy in the moment to do it. Uh, or he could cost them a lot. He could go. And that's why I keep making him the X factor. Because I think there is like a runway of expectation for almost all the other players. But I'm literally saying one for 20, the problem, or seven for 20 in the ALCS MVP. And and and, and honestly, you could convince me either without much work. <laughs> That's fair enough. Tommy, uh, Jazz is uh, Joel's X Factor. Who's yours? I'm going Aaron Judge. Joel said it. He had three chances to hit the kill shot in this series and came up 0 for 3 in that. I think you can survive that against the Royals. I'm not sure you can survive that against the Guardians who shortened the game to five, six innings. If you don't get that kill shot early, that's been the theme of the show is hitting their starting pitching. If he doesn't come up with that kill shot early, it might be the difference in the game. The Yankees were able to hit uh, some of the Royals relievers. They were able to draw walks in that game one late to drive in some runs. It's not going to be the case against the Guardians. Aaron Judge needs to step up and, and start playing like the MVP Aaron Judge that, he, that he's been in this season. I hear you on that. I would love to see Judge have a huge series. Uh, for me, it would probably – I don't want to go Austin Wells again because he had a tough series. Uh, I, I kind of want to go with Glaber Torres. Uh, Glaber. Or fuck, maybe go Juan Soto. You know, I'm just going to go Juan Soto. <laughs> so, so, Soto is like – I know he's a – yeah, well, it's that, Tommy, but also what Joel said before is resonating with me a little bit. When you said, like, his at-bats were, you know, so no good, but, like, it felt like there could have been more from him. And I just wonder, is he going to have a couple of those Yankees postseason moments here where it's a tie game late in the game and you're going up against that monster bullpen against Cleveland and he just, Juan Soto hits absolute bomb to right field and we're going, like, holy shit, that's why the Yankees traded for this guy. Like, this is why we're going all in for the World Series this year. I just wonder if he's going to have that type of series against the Cleveland Guardians. I just, I'm going to go with Soto. That's my X factor. All right, uh, Tommy, thank you so much as always. We're going to wrap this thing up. Appreciate you, man. No problem. All right, Joel, time for Joel's notebook before we get to predictions here for the series. Yankees, Guardians, I know you've shared, and and I, I this resonates with me too, when you shared that moment with your dad, uh, you know, it, covering in, in the, these moments, the Yankees in Cleveland in the playoffs. Is there anything else that comes to mind that you would love to share with the Yankees family here and the Yankees fans that 
of when it comes to Yankees Guardians in the playoffs or Yankees Cleveland, as I keep saying it? Yeah, um, the one with my dad obviously resonates. It was uh, I, I know I had told the story on here after my mom passed away and bringing him to the uh, ALCS in '98. Uh, which and and John Sterling and Michael Kay allowing him to sit in the radio booth for the uh, games there. Uh, you know, those guys are always just mean everything to me because how good they were to my dad. Um, uh, uh, I mentioned the midges, obviously. I learned what they 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 were along the way. Uh, just just throwing this in. Do you know the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is Saturday night? Oh, I did not. So people are, will be piling into the city, and the Browns play on Sunday. I only know this because hotel rates are out oh, through the roof. And I'm like, why is Cleveland through the roof? And, uh, yeah, Mary J. Blige, you go, girl. And uh, uh, so there's that. I will say this because just to show you the difference in maybe how long I've been around in the world is in the um, – they used to play in Cleveland Stadium, uh, the, uh, the the Guardian uh, – the Indians back then, Cleveland. And, uh, you know, I think it was like an 80,000 seat stadium. And, you know, there were times I'd be there and there'd be like 3,000 people there. That's how bad Cleveland and the Yankees were in the early 90s. And, you know, you'd go in. I remember talking to John Hart when he was the GM once in like the Rotunda area. And I mean, the wind is whipping through there, etc. But I'll tell you the crazy thing about that stadium. It had incredibly small press box, incredibly small press box. And uh, the Yankee beat was uh, just the beat was eight guys back then. Uh, eight newspapers traveled with the team. Uh, uh, so even if it was just the eight of us, it's not a big game. I mean, you are like sardines as the thing. And they had fluorescent lights. And it was known as the mistake on the lake. It was almost mm-hmm. like you could touch Lake Erie. And to save money after the game, the lights in the ballpark would go out like this. But the fluorescent light would stay on in summer in the press box. And the lake was nearby. And you would hear it first, and then you'd see it, and then you'd live with it. All the flies from the lake would start coming to the light. And you're in this tiny press. It's like a freaking horror movie. You talk about learning to write fast. Like like your July 19th meaningless Yankee Cleveland game in 1990, 91, that era. You learn to write fast at that thing. Because after the game, it was you, seven tightly bunched guys. And I mean thousands and thousands of flies on that on those on that uh fluorescent light yeah cleveland uh it's an interesting place to go watch a ball game uh i i went to school in ohio so i've been to a bunch of uh indians games myself they do dollar dog night which is always nuts uh they, they have some crazy fans it's it's gonna be an electric atmosphere when the yankees go there for three and four um but yeah we're looking forward five. to seeing in five that's true and five uh hopefully it doesn't go to five that'd be crazy but now speaking of which time for predictions joel what are you predicting for this alcs yeah, I picked the Yankees in five in the paper. Uh, I'll stick with that. Uh, look, the, the Yankees have a tendency to make things tougher on them. The, the reality is, like with the Royals, they're just better than Cleveland. They were 4-2 and two against Cleveland during the season. The two games they lost were ghost runner games uh, during the, the regular season. They're better than them. Will that fully express itself during the playoffs? It's like the last round. There's a lot of jobs and legacies on the line here. Uh, um, I'm just going to go with the better team and understand that there's a a natty, G-N-A-T-T-Y, a natty way for the, 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 the Guardians to win, which is pesky at bats and get the elite to that bullpen. I do think Yankee fans who aren't familiar with it, by the end of next week, will be very familiar with Herring, Gaddis, Smith, Classe, and not wanting to see their team down four to two in the seven. If that, if they, if a couple of games get there, as we see, you know, Lane Thomas, you know, you just oh. you're, you're always just one swing away from the nightmare of having to score off that bullpen. And so the Yankees, 
it's almost got to be merciless against the starting pitching, which is not terrible, terrible, but is the Achilles arm of this Guardians team. And the Yankees can't just be like, oh, we got one in the first and one in the fourth. Uh, it's going to keep a game close and that bullpen in play for Cleveland. When they have those shots that Judge had three times in the previous series, you know, what's the line from the wire? Do you, you know, like, bet, best not miss, right? Like, if you have a shot at the king, you best not miss. Like, if you, they've got a shot to open the game up, they've got to do what the Dodgers did to the Mets last night. They got to open that game up and uh, de emphasize mm-hmm. the strength of the Guardians. Yeah, take take the wind out of their sail. I just, uh, I, I, I think Yankees in five makes the most sense. But for some reason, the Yankees just haven't been able to flex their muscles on these teams, you know, and, the, and these teams that aren't as talented as them. So I do wonder if it goes six, but I do think Yankees win this series. I, I'll, I'll go with five like you. It's time for them to flex their muscles, though. It's time for you to, to power through these guys, show them why you're one of the most talented teams in baseball, and just dominate. Dominate from start to finish. Uh, and and let's see let's see who comes through. Let's see who, who is that X factor in this series. Joel, that's an American League Championship Series preview. We're looking forward to seeing your coverage throughout this entire series, how it develops, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking to you soon, man, to see how it goes. And I look, if there's a pitch for an entire section, like. I can't tell you how much how stretched a sports section in New York is right now, right? Got the Giants and the Jets, got the Knicks, three hockey teams. We're covering the Nets. We're covering the Liberty in the finals. And we are still putting the kind of manpower on this postseason that makes me proud to work for this section because we still do it old style where we, uh, we're overflowing, the, overflooding the zone. And uh, this is a pitch for... Uh, buy a newspaper, buy a subscription online. Don't just read it for free because those hotels in Cleveland with the hall with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Browns over the weekend aren't free. And to continue to do what we want to do, which is provide great coverage to the people who are nice enough to read our stuff or watch our our uh, webcast or listen to uh, my and John Heyman's podcast, like please. Think about that, that you don't go into a deli and get a sandwich for free. And we've all taught you to that you should get news for free. You shouldn't. Buy a subscription online or delivery and allow us to keep doing what we're doing. Well said, Joel. Well said. We're looking forward to seeing. Hit that like, hit that subscribe button on the New York Post Sports YouTube channel. This is where we do it for the Yankees Pinstripe Post every single Monday. And we'll be looking forward to speaking to you again, Joel, hopefully soon. (laughs) Thanks, man. Sure.